Am I on? I'm going to uh, start today by reading from James, the fifth chapter. As soon as I find it. James, fifth chapter, starting verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Ye also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, and seen the end intended the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. All right, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for James and his word. And uh, Lord, we know you tell us that uh, our adversary, the devil, walks about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Lord, we see the events that are happening in the Middle East right now, and the, the just uh, sadness, anger us. But Lord, we know that they just uh, grieve you, we pray. And Lord, it seems like uh, everything in the world is spinning out of a control. But Father, we know, Lord, that you are in control. The creator of the universe is there. And the Lord, we know that you will take care of the situation and comfort those who are suffering right now on uh, both sides of the conflict. Be with us this day, we pray. Strengthen us, guide us, and uh, comfort us, we pray in Jesus' name. I always have trouble getting start started. That makes me just all oh, bad, nervous. I'm not a preacher. I'm not an orator. But so I'm going to start out with a little story. Something that happened to me 50 years ago. I was working for my uh, aunt's husband, a guy named William Howard Kahn. We always called him Bub, though, and that's the only name that I knew. But Bub was full of advice. Uh, and sometimes that advice backfired on him. We were working on a timber sale uh, north of Clark Fork, right on the banks of the uh, Lightning Creek. And boy, they don't call it Lightning Creek for nothing, because in the spring of the year, it's just a wall of water coming down. And it uproots trees. Uh, it just washes the soil away from the base of the trees. And, uh, and they tip over into the creek. So the Forest Service would allow people, to, timber companies, to come in and salvage the trees. And that's what our job was. It took about 45 minutes from Clark Fort to the job, job site. Uh, so all the way up, my uncle was saying, boy, don't fall in that creek, you freeze to death. And it was cold all right. There were chunks of ice floating down the creek, still s snow in the road. So we get to the job site, step out of the truck, and there's a great big cedar, it's about this big around, laying out into the current, into the creek. My uncle said, cut that off the stump, or it'll, it'll split if we, you know, try to pull it out. And then uh, he looked at me and said, well, you better cut the top out first, or it'll split right up the middle. I said, okay. So I head out toward it, and he said, oh, boy, it's got an awful bind in it there. The current's really got a hold of it. He said, you better let, better let me do it. So I handed him my saw. And he walked up there, limbing his way up, until it was about, oh, that big around at the top. He put one foot on one side of it on a limb and the other foot on the other side like that. And he touched the top of that tree with the saw, and it went like that. You ever seen a kid take a pea on the end of a spoon and flip it at somebody like that? That's what it looked like. He just skipped across the water, just soaking wet. 
came back. I said, boy, don't fall in that creek. You freeze to death. Okay, bub. So he went and changed his clothes, boots, and everything. And he disappeared down the, the creek. And I'm going along lemon trees. And he comes back, and he's soaking wet again. He'd been gone about 20 minutes. And uh, he came up. I said, what'd you do? Fell in the creek. I got to go home. So my cousin Jack, who was running the skitter, came uh, driving up. He was just laughing his head off. And uh, I said, what's so funny? Uh, he couldn't get it out, but he was laughing so hard. Finally, when he composed himself, he said, well, Bub climbed up on this big white pine tree that was laying across the creek like that, and he was going to go to the other side, see if there were logs on the other side. He said he took a few steps out, and that tree was right over a great big deep beaver pond. So he chickened out. He got down on his hands and knees as he's crawling away, crawling across it. And he chickened out even more, so he got down and wrapped his arms and legs around the trunk of the tree, and he's inching his way across like an inchworm like that. And he got right out in the middle of the beaver pond, and the bark turned loose. He went right in the creek. None of us, the rest of us, fell on the creek. What has that got to do with my sermon today? Well, uh, his advice was good. It was cold. He had good advice, but he had no foundation. He had a movable foundation. That brings us to Job. James tell us, tells us to take Job as an example of perseverance. And that's the name of my, uh, the title of my message today is Stand Firm. Hmm? Stand Fast. Stand, stand Fast, do the same thing. Basically, that's what perseverance, persevere means stand fast, be steadfast. But uh, And the book of Job's is, the book of Job's is, uh, where we get that reference. What do we know about the book of Job? I've got a document here that was written by uh, Adam Clark, who was the leading commentary uh, commentarian and uh, actually a contemporary of John Wesley. He states, about the book of Job. This is the most singular book in the whole of the sacred code, though written by the same inspiration and in reference to the same end, the salvation of men, it is so different from every other book of the Bible that it seems to possess nothing in common with them. For even the language is, in, it is con in its construction is dissimilar to, from that in the law, the prophets, and the historical books. What form of literature is it then? It's an epic poem, just like the Iliad or the Odyssey, yeah. or, uh, or Virgil's Aeneid. That's a poem that tells a, a story. But unlike the, the Iliad or the Aeneid that are just myth, Job was a real person. We don't know much about Job at all. There's only one mention of Job in the New Testament, the one I just read, and two in the Old Testament. And they're both in, in Ezekiel 14, 14, and 14, 20. And that's the only mention of Job outside the book of Job. Although there is another man named Job as well in other scripture, but it's not the same Job. And how do we know that? spelled differently in the Hebrew. And the other Job is, is actually his name is, is Jashub. What's the theme of Job? Perseverance. I attended a, uh, a conference at Warner Pacific University in 1991. My Hebrew professor at uh, Western Evangelical Seminary was involved in an interfaith fellowship uh, between Christians and, and the Jewish community there in Portland. 
he'd spent many years living in, in Israel and had developed a lot of uh, Jewish friends. But the speaker at the, at the meeting was the president of Asbury Theological Seminary. I think he was the past president. It wasn't the president. So you know what kind of message he had, I preached. Asbury Theological Seminary is, it was founded in 1923 by the president of Asbury College. That's the college where the revival started in, in February. So you can imagine what type of uh, message it was. And it was it was powerful, powerful message. And uh, and at the end of the sermon, a young Jewish rabbi stood up. And I uh, I can see his face today. I half expected a little light bulb to show show up over his head. And he asked if he'd speak, and uh, and the speaker said, of course. He said he'd read the book of Job, studied the book of Job all his life, basically. He never understood it. The theme of the message, the theme of the conference is why uh, do good people suffer more? So why does God let um, uh, good people suffer? And he said he never could understand why Job suffered so much. Job is, is a righteous man. God himself says Job is a righteous man. But why did God allow him to suffer? And, uh, and the, the speaker basically yeah, gave his idea of why. But uh, he said he'd never heard that before. And it is, he said he knew that was true. And it was a gospel message. It was an evangelical holiness message to begin with. What about the book of Job? There's a problem with the book of Job. Um, Most uh, Jewish thought, even today, believe in a, a misrepresentation. And the, uh, my book here, in the introduction to it, says, the author of Job lived during a time when people misapplied the doctrine of God's rewards and punishments. It was assumed that the righteous were always richly blessed and the wicked always experienced untold hardships leading to a premature death. This idea is the doctrine of double retribution. People assume that whoever suffered terribly could not possibly be upright in God's sight. Those who feared God felt compelled to defend him by accusing of wrongdoing any person who suffered regardless of that person's righteous conduct. That's a description, basically, of what happened to Job. The book of Job starts with a description of Job. It says, Job, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. That's the author's description, but on the next page, God himself says, and then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant? Have you considered my ser servant Job? That there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So God himself says uh, Job is blameless. But Satan likes to claim that Job was only serving you because you protect him. You're giving him wealth. So God says, take away everything he has. You're, you're allowed to take away everything he has. Well, that's what happens. Sabians come in and steal all his cattle and, his, and all his possessions. A mighty wind comes up, blows his house down on top of his children, kills all his children. 
And, and Job's reply to that is, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <coughs> and all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. So Satan says, well, a man's possessions, really, he can live without those, but his health, you know, if, if you smite him, he will curse you to your face. So the Lord says, uh, do what you will, but don't, don't kill him. Do everything you can, but don't kill him. So the, Satan smites him with boils to the point that he's in constant misery. Well, his friends uh, hear about this. And uh, this is after his wife tells him to curse God and die. Well, that's not real good advice. But, but his, his friends show up. And they are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they each give three speeches, one right after the other, and then three separate times. And they think God is smiting Job because he did some terrible sin, which he didn't. But that's their idea. God, he, he's suffering. He must have done something wrong. First one to speak is Eliphaz. And Eliphaz says, No one is righteous before God. He is not, not saying that, that Job has sinned, but he's kind of hinting at it. Then the next one to, to speak is, is Bildad. Bildad the Shuhite, shortest man in the Bible. Shuhite. Bildad said, God always acts justly. So he's basically saying, you, you deserve what you're getting here. And the next is Zophar. And this is their whole line of reasoning. The righteous prosper, the wicked suffer. So, so Job must be wicked in some way, because he's suffering. But, but Job's response is, his only response is, God's affliction is too great for me. He is literally to the point where he wants God to, to, to kill him, to take him out of pain. And, uh, and he doesn't know why God doesn't. And Job's problem is he knows he's innocent or thinks he's innocent, but if he's not, he doesn't know what sin he committed. So, so there's a second round. And Eliphaz says, the wicked will not escape punishment. And again, he's hinting that, that Job needs to repent of his sin. Job's response, a heavenly witness will stand up for me. And he does. And then Bildad says, in the prime of life, the wicked will die. Okay, then and Job's response, God will act as my redeemer. Which is, then Zophar says, sinful deeds will destroy the wicked. Job's response, why do the wicked why do the wicked go unpunished? If that be the case that that God rewards the good and and punishes the the wicked. There's wicked acts going on all the time. Why doesn't God punish the wicked? So 
That kind of stumps them. Then the third discourse, Eliphaz just out and out says, Job, you have sinned, so repent. Job's response, where is God? I am innocent. I am confident of my innocence. And Bildad says, no one is righteous in God's sight. Job's response, I will not speak falsely for personal gain. God is to be praised. Then Job goes on and speaks even more. These accusers, three times they've, they've uh, tried to force Job to repent of his sin. Well, Job doesn't know what sin he has to repent of. But uh, then a young man named Elihu comes along. And he's, he's mad at Job because he won't repent of his sin. And he's mad at the three accusers as well because they haven't, uh, haven't uh, forced Job to confess his sin. So he's, he's mad at everybody. I see this young man. He's probably about 16 years old. He's mad at the world. And I know from my own personal experience that is so... There was a period in my life that I was mad at the world. But he gets through with his uh, last statements. He has four statements. He makes four statements. Then his last statement, Elihu, says, God's greatness is revealed in the storm. And he doesn't know when that's exactly what happens because God shows up. And Job has been asking for to the Lord to show him where his sin is, and just kind of all completely obsessed with pleading, what, what's my sin? And he ex expects when the Lord shows up in the whirlwind that he will find out. But that's not what the Lord had in mind. He starts asking him questions. Where were you? at the creation of the world. Work, and can you draw Leviathan out with a fish hook? And the point he's making is, I am the creator, I am in control of things. And, and Job realizes that he may technically be free of sin. He is sinful in that he he believes that he is righteous on his own, that he himself is keeping him righteous. But the statement when, uh, by Job, when he realizes that, no, I'm not as righteous as I, he says, I have heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's when then God shows up and he says, And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is roused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job and offer for yourself a burnt offering. My servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have spoke, not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. How do we answer the question then that's posed? Why do, why does God allow uh, good, righteous people to suffer? We know that God is love. And we also know that all things work together for the good for those who 
love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Therefore, even though God is allowing Satan to persecute Job, it's for his own good. It brings him to the realization that, that, that Job knew about God, knew all the rules and everything. And, and Job, the actual Job was probably before the Mosaic Law because they, they think Job would, acts of the Job lived between a thousand and two year, thousand years BC. So this is before the Mosaic Law. But Job was living according to all the rules that he uh, knew. But he was doing it on his own. And we as uh, Christian people tend to do that. I looked at Job and I realized that, uh, that John Wesley was a, kind of a, an example of, of Job. John Wesley was raised in a Christian home. His father was a minister and his mother was a devout woman. He was in a fire, I was pulled out of a fire when he was six years old in 1709. And Susanna Wesley dedicated him to the Lord, just like Samuel's mother did. And, uh, and Wesley grew up in the Anglican church. His father was an Anglican minister. And all the church trappings from his father, but he had the Puritan uh, knowledge coming from his mother. So John Wesley, for most of his life, was upright, what we would call a pious person. In 1727, he uh, uh, applied to go into the ministry, basically. He, and he went to Oxford College. At Oxford College, Charles Wesley and John Wesley and George Whitfield formed the Holy Club with the idea that they would change England. England was in a bad way at this time. They were just horribly uh, immoral. Well, it didn't work too good for Wesley, so he, he hopped on a boat to, to the New World to Georgia, actually the colony of Georgia, where he figured he would convert the, the colonists there and, and the native population at well, as well. It didn't go over too big there. Most of those uh, colonists were there and fled to England and the, the Anglican church and fled to England where they could practice their, their beliefs and the native population didn't want anything to do with him. But uh, he kept pushing and pushing to the point that uh, he refused one of the main clergymen there uh, communion because he hadn't been, <laughs> because he hadn't been uh, baptized by a Anglican uh, minister. So he left Georgia, uh, basically uh, just right ahead of the law because they were about ready to arrest him. Well, on the way over, Wesley was on the boat and the boat ran into a huge storm and it was about ready to sink and Wesley was terrified. He didn't know if he was good enough to you know, he had been good enough to warrant salvation. So on the boat he met a, a bunch of Moravians. They were uh, followers of a, a man named Zinzendorf. And Zinzendorf uh, preached that you have to have a personal relationship God, with God, not just a... a, a uh, just just knowledge of well that impressed him these people were calm they were ready to die 
didn't bother him one bit if the, the boat went down. Well, that stayed in his mind. So when he got back to to England, he was a broken man. He was just depressed, and and his ministry was done for. So he he went and found a Moravian church, Aldersgate Church in, in London. And this is his comments. Let's see if I find them here. This is Wesley. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and assurance was given, given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That's his... That's the experience he based the doctrine of entire sanctification on. Wesley knew about of Christ all his life. He was raised in the church, but he had never met Christ personally. I'm thankful for this church here. I really am, because this church holds that belief that that we must know. God personally, I, I believe everyone here has 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 met Christ in that way. So, and on that foundation, that knowledge through personal knowledge, that's the foundation of our faith. And that's the only way we are going to stand firm, stand fast in our faith. Father be with us the rest of this time. And Lord, send your spirit, we pray. Help us to stand fast. We know, Lord, uh, that you are coming soon. Or we really hope that you're coming soon. Just bless us and keep us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The older I get,